Hi, I'm Chris Madrid, and I am sitting here with Ann Coleman and Michael Canales, two of the very important doll personalities today. And we're going to discuss their relationship with someone that we should all know and remember, John Darcy Noble. So my first question is for Ann. And I know that um, John had a relationship with Eleanor St. George, but can you tell and me And you'd about like that? to know. I would like to know. Because you like paper mache dolls, early paper do. mache dolls. And always one of the things that has come up is a question about where the term Milner's model came from. In the very early days when I met John, he worked at the Museum of the City of New York, as I think you've mentioned. and. I just happened to have brought with me the copy of the letter from Eleanor St. George in which she tells all about how she began to use the term Milliner's model. Wow. So there you are, a bit of John Noble, straight from the hand, very, very weak hand of Eleanor St. George. Wow. Now, he did, did he agree with her uh, uh, naming of it? Because uh, she basically invented the word herself. And she acknowledges that it is that so many words in doll collecting are words that collectors have devised for the dolls that they're talking about. Well, didn't, my, didn't John himself coin uh, Alien Head? Uh, I think he did. I think he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think he did. Which I always find, I find that quite amusing. I like alien heads. I like saying it too. Well, I, I, I think it's, it, it, it helps with the conversation. If you're, if John and I were having a conversation and he said, oh, I, I have this wonderful alien head that I just found in a drawer, I would know what he meant. Exactly. Rather than, is it a, 1860s head? Is it a... a, a it describes its construction. A, yes, yes. What's even how people right now, everybody called wooden dolls Queen Anne, and now they're calling Mary, Mary Anne, William, Queen Anne, Regent, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's correct, but it's kind of a mouthful. It's a mouthful, but it's accurate. Yeah. Again, it's, uh, it describes the time frame in which that particular type of doll was produced. And the people who invented that long word, Mary Ann Georgian, were friends of John's. Oh, really? Uh, Ruth and uh, Bob or Robert Mathis, who were great uh, scholars uh, in their time, again, about the same time that John was working. and. Um, it uh, was I, but, but they were a little older than John. Weren't they? they were older than John, yeah. but they were working at the same yes. time. And um, he, I think he really got to know them very well when he moved out here to California. We have John's papers, and, um, and he had their papers, so we have their papers mm -hmm. too. And uh, they did a trip to Paris in the 50s, and they went to uh, Madame Galea's home. Mm -hmm and she gave them a, a tour, and they described room by room what was in the home, and now all those dolls are in the Princess Grace Museum. That's so he had the, we kind of have a good description of what the collection was like uh, before Princess Grace. Do you wanna talk yeah. about what Princess Grace and, and the museum? I've never got there. Have you never got there? I never got there. Well, you know, she was from Hollywood, and a, a lot from of From Philadelphia, I know, excuse but, me. But when, when some of the, the original clothes that looked a little shabby, she had them redressed so that they looked, you know, because she was from Hollywood. Yeah. And it's kind of an interesting, but, but they did have a very close relationship, those Well, the math is more interesting because they also uh, thought a lot like John in that adults needed to look at toys and dolls from the point of view of a child. And that's where their primary interest was in 
how children played with dolls. He was a, uh, a scientist with Bell Laboratories, so he was nobody's dumb bunny to begin no. with. And um, she was equally bright. And that's the, how they came at dolls, and that's one of the features of John's interest in dolls was um, not who made the doll, but how the child interacted mm -hmm. with the doll. Didn't, John said something too about that um, parents were the ones who bought the dolls, not they the still children, do. yeah. and how the social status and had had a lot of influence on what types of dolls were purchased for children. I think they still do. I, I think that is a, a, a timeless theme. That it really has to. The advertising to the is done for the adult, and not, and not necessarily the child. Yeah, I mean I think it still is, and and uh, I mean a lot of people are collecting today because of trauma of not getting their say their Barbie because the, the mother thought it was too sexy. Um, uh, I, I think that parents and grandparents are very important in the selection of dolls. Aunts and I mean, uncles. Yes, too. yes. Yeah. I mean, we can want and want, yeah. but somebody's got to put the money on the yeah. counter. That's right. So I have a question for you, Michael. Uh -oh. When did you first meet John, and what was your first impression of him? Well, I, uh, in, the, in the 1980s, I met John because I had met Dorothy Coleman and Jane Coleman, and we became very good friends very fast. And they had a wonderful way of connecting up like-minded people. So they connected me with John, and I called him on the phone, and we had a normal three-hour phone call, because it was always three hours with John. And we instantly became friends. And then very early in our doll club uh, uh, days, we had John was a lecturer twice for our group. And, you know, it was just we hit it off. And he was just absolutely fascinating to talk to. So you could talk to him about anything. Oh, one thing, uh, uh, there are videotapes of him giving lectures, and, and he was an absolute pro at that. But by nature, he was actually very shy. So if you were in a, in a party, he would focus in on you and give you 100% of his attention. So, you know, we just became very good friends. And it, you know, went on and on and on. And through the years, we did other, other things. You know, we arranged for him to, to speak to groups. And it, it was always great. I mean, it wouldn't matter what happened. If the, I mean, I'm sure, I know you had some mishaps. He was just such a pro that he could, he could do a program on anything, whatever you wanted to talk about. I know you have some funny stories about him giving programs and the mishaps. Well, there's the famous one of the convention, UFDC convention in New York City, and he was scheduled to give an evening program, and the organization had hired a uh, professional uh, projectionist, and then those were in the days of carousel slide trays, where each slide went into a little container, but you had to be careful when you took the uh, container off the uh, projector, not to move the bottom ring. This professional moved the bottom ring and several slides fell out. They picked the slides up, they started to, to put them back into the carousel, and they took out the upper ring, which held everything in place. What they then did was they turned the carousel over without the ring that held all the slides in, and there was a cascade of slides onto the floor. John yells at me in the audience, and go upstairs to the booth and see if you can't put the, pro uh, the program back together. You know how I think, <laughs> so you can do it. <laughs> before an audience of then probably about 1,500 people. <laughs> I, I was not completely successful, but um, I was able to salvage a bit of it. But he could wing it so that it yes. would be just... Yeah. Uh, we have um, quite a few of his programs 
and I have looked at them and they've all been transferred over to digital. And I look at them and I think, what was he going to say here? Is you just, and you can sometimes almost guess because when you read his books, it really is, that's, that's his voice. So you could almost kind of figure out where he was going. But some of the titles of his programs are hysterical. You know, uh, you, you have one particular favorite. Right, and I was actually gonna ask, I actually was gonna ask both of you about it because, you know, John was very much about um, originality. And the name of this program was uh, Redress It Honey, Nobody's Gonna Know the Difference Anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's classic John. John, yeah. <laughs> so, do you think that that was at odds with his idea of being everything the original? or No, because he felt that dolls had a life of their own and that their life should continue. And if you felt that you could improve the doll by redressing it, fine, do it. But there were certain dolls which should be viewed as sacred territory and not touched in any way. I totally agree with his philosophy. And I think that he was really at the forefront of from way ahead of his time, way ahead of his time of promoting excellence in restoration, costuming. Uh, some of his dolls were costumed by notable costume designers that the costumes themselves are far more important than the actual doll. Yeah. And uh, another thing that I think is very sad is John was not given credit for his promotion of early doll artists. He really was the first person to absolutely do that. And I will take exception to that. Do you? Yes, Janet Joel was the, uh, a I generation guess, yes. before. Yes. And she was the, but he, uh, he really he put them out there and he gave them in good, magazines. good mm -hmm. press and publications. Yeah. Yeah. And and but he's also another generation. He's another generation to, of uh, more doll reader and dolls magazine. And then, and there are also um, more artists, doll artists working during his time than there Denver's. were in, yes. in uh, um, Jones time. And another thing. Some people just have a way of seeing the future. And, you know, right now we have this renaissance of wooden dolls all, you know, being made in Russia and America and Canada and all these incredible artists that are doing um, those things. He was, he was promoting that 40 years ago. And it's taken really almost 40 years for them to catch up to right. what he was do, uh, interested in. So, you want to talk about Belinda? Well, Belinda is a perfect example. I mean, Belinda was within a millimeter to uh, an original uh, wooden doll, and she fooled a lot of people. Uh, I mean, that, you know, as a, as a proving that these things can be done, like a master copy. But it took a long time before people thought, I could do that, or I should try that. And now they are. But he was at the forefront of that, promoting it, writing about it, um, sharing it. Um, but he was also up front. Oh, he, he was up front. Right in the name. I mean, even there he gives a, yes. a Linda the lovely cheat. When we were handling his collection, he had a doll that was made by um, um, Nicholas Bramble, mm. the most incredible little artist boy. And we were visiting the famous collector, Lucy Morgan. And I took it with her to show her. And I showed it to her and I said, you know, this is a really fabulous doll and it's $75,000. And she went, I just love it. And I, let, I, I went on with this for quite some time. And then I said, Lucy, this is an artist doll made in the 1980s. But he saw that it had the same thing that an Albert Mark had. And so, of course, we sold it to her for you know, not much money. But 
that fit in with his collection with his ancient things. It was true to... It's time. It's time. Uh, and, and Nicholas Bramble was, um, by profession, uh, worked at um, Madame Tussauds and was a mannequin maker. So this had the very beautiful proportions of this little boy. But John, many people wouldn't have been interested in that. You know, we do have a little bit of doll, uh, doll snobbery. Mm -hmm. John was not a doll snob. I mean, he... The last thing. The last thing. No, he was not a doll snob. If he liked it, he liked it. So, and oftentimes the quirkier it was, oh, yes. the more he liked it. I think if you read his books, and the one thing I like about reading his articles and his books is that it isn't hard fact. It's not, this was in this, it, it has emotion and it talks about the essence of dolls in a way, essence of collecting. It's, they're very charming and as, as Michael said, you know you're reading. Yes, and, I, and I, I, I totally agree with you. However, I will add that John had the, the gift of giving you that one little thing that he figured out that no one else did. And it's that one thing that stuck with you and helped you understand um, just some little detail like uh, pin money to explain to you what that really, where, where that came from. Um, so he always gave you just one little, um, I mean, he was highly intelligent. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, Lord, yes. Yes, I mean, highly intelligent. Yes. And um, he just always had something. And of course, he was entertaining, and that makes you really, your brain receptive to his information. I know. I remember one time I was fortunate, I saw him twice. Um, lecture and he was showing dolls and he was showing this lovely doll and she said well I don't have her anymore um, so she stopped singing to me so she had to go away and so he looked at dolls as important historical but also as um, toys enjoyment mm -hmm. oh absolutely and I think his collection changed over over just as you mentioned. I mean, I think he had a lot of things that we would say, you know, brews and chameaux and, uh, you know, German characters and things. And as he got older, his doll collection got older. No, he, I remember one, actually I used it in a program I did talking about like wax overs, wax over paper machés, and talked about pleasing decay in terms yeah. of architecture and in dolls that have weathered and do not look brand new, but they're, they still have value and they still have beauty. Well, well, if you look at the chapters in this book of his, his first major book, Beautiful Dolls, the list of chapters is- Oh, they're fabulous. So wonderful. You don't need to know that it's an AM, uh, Armand Marseille doll or a Marianne Georgian or whatever. It's the the heart that's brought out in the title of the um, chapter. It's not all hard facts. It, it, it takes you down a totally different type of path. It's not rock strewn with um, facts. It leaves a lot to your imagination and he always picks up uh, points and shows you points that you wouldn't necessarily pick out in absolutely just Isn't that what I just said <laughs> oh I'm sorry I repeated you <laughs> well but you said it in a much more intellectual way <laughs> so I know that you and your family who are very well known to everyone were working were in the doll community and doing research and everything. How was that working with him in the 60s and 70s? Absolutely wonderful. I have so many incredible memories of John. John and I, uh, very early on, did something that um, was a real coup for me in particular, because I was just starting out my career. There was a Winter Antiques Forum 
for high rollers in the uh, American antique field held at Williamsburg, Virginia. And uh, we were invited to do the uh, forum. They did it twice and basically the same program, but with different speakers for each of the two sessions. And I got the first session and he got the second session. And uh, he came back to Washington afterwards and uh, we had a wonderful time because it was a snowy evening. And we had a, he'd never had a snowball fight. <laughs> and so, I got to introduce him to Snowball Fights. Now, you know, this was John at his very best. Oh, totally. He loved the thought after I convinced him that he would. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's John. So how did he view your mother? I think he thought of my mother as another mother. And I think um, she certainly could never ever deal with having had a son. She, I can tell you stories about her and uh, sons and my babysitting business where it was a disaster when she insisted to take over. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and you knew my mother, yes. so you know. Uh, yeah. But Your mother he, was he, sweet, he, but she could be very scary. Uh, yes, that's why we called her Mrs. Coleman. I mean, you know, <laughs> we had to put her in her place. You know? um, but anyway, he, he had lots of long conversations with her uh, discussing, I think, much more personal things than he'd ever discussed with me. Uh, I was I just his chauffeur. I think your mother would be someone that you could, uh, you could count on her... Um, Confidence. Yes, Dis discretion, yeah. And, yeah. and I think she was very practical and level-headed. And, and the other interesting thing in the correspondence that I have from him, uh, and I asked a, a friend of mine who had worked with him at the Museum of the City of New York if she knew of any other occasion. Um, to me and to my mother, he signed his letters, Johnny. And I asked her if she, knew of anybody else that he signed uh, communications as Johnny. And uh, I, don't, I don't think he did. As in the paperwork you, that we have, there's no Johnny. I mean, we called him Johnny and John, but not. There we have it, right yeah. there. And that, that I take as a tremendous it compliment. Is. And 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 particularly for his generation. Yes, yes. So, Michael. Yes. Do you have any funny stories about John? Well, I, I, I have, well, there's a lot, but there's a lot that I can't tell on camera. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we had a wonderful relationship. And um, when we handled his collection, and that's another kind of story that's not exactly funny, but it, um, so as we handled his collection, remember John was an artist. John was not a business person. He was never good with business. And then when he finally handled his collection, which went very nice, it was a very nice um, experience, we only ever had one cross situation. And um, that's when John's Cockney accent came out because he, he, as a little boy, he trained his voice off of the BBC. So he retrained his voice to have this very posh, professional English. So he called me up and said, I am very upset. That dollhouse, I just cannot sell that for $750. And I said, well, I am so sorry it's already sold. And then I, just for fun, being naughty, I let him go on because this kind of cockney voice came out and he was just very upset that I didn't do it right. And he went on and I said, I, I said I'm sorry, John, I cannot get the dollhouse back, it's, it's gone. And then I said, but it sold for $7,500. And he said, oh, darling, 
I can never get pounds and dollars right. <laughs> and at that point, he'd been living here for 50 <laughs> years. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that was kind of the typical, uh, 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 but the, you know, we never had any problems. Uh, I mean, one thing that David and I did do once we handled the collection, we kind of tried to, with the two of them, Johnny and Bobby, be parents because they were very irresponsible. So the first thing I wanted to do is you've got to get your house paid for because they were paying a huge payment on a very little bit of money. And I had a very hard time explaining to him that if he didn't have to pay the payment, he had more money, but he just couldn't get it. And so they did pay their house off and they did live a very nice time for a while. And then I went to visit them and they'd taken some of the money and bought the, this ginormous statue of a little boy, you know, or a young man peeing. I shouldn't say peeing, but tinkling. <laughs> and it's like, did you really need that? <laughs> So there was, you know, there were lots of things that, you know, you could always count on a good laugh with John. You know, he had a way of seeing things. And I think, you, it, uh, maybe see what you think about this. I think that his war experiences, watching everything um, blow up around yeah. him, that he just had a different, some people go the opposite way, and he was really one of the most sensual people ever. If he was smelling a rose, it was the most beautiful rose. If he was eating a strawberry, it was the most mm -hmm. delicious. Uh, I mean, he just saw things in a different way where I'm sure he had worries, but I don't think you ever really knew that. I mean, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he loved life. He did. He did. He and, really he, did. and he saw beauty everywhere. I mean, I've read, read, uh, read, read some descriptions of people that he's, he's written. That's like, I know them, and that's not really. <laughs> but it was the way he saw them yeah. it, it, and it how is. he saw things. It is. I mean, yeah. I've some of the, I'm kind of with you. I've seen descriptions he's written about other people, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and, but that could be very well his, his relationship. Because he just had, you know, he, he actually had, I think, very, uh, what I would call with people, um, that's 19, a 19, a romantic friendships, that they were very tactile, but in the sense mm -hmm. with words. And, uh, uh, and, it, and if he liked someone and he liked their art, he really worked hard to promote that. So he was yeah. really all in. Yeah. It's poodles or Persian cats, or wooden dolls. A totally a love of life. So I would like you to describe John in three words. Three words, that's not enough. Um, charming. Um, delightful. Uh, hmm. Present, present, very present. I mean, we, we uh, sometimes around here, I'm gonna get up. Go on to her. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 I've got it together. We can go back. Okay. I got it together. Sometimes I think, gee, wouldn't he love this? And he would love this whole conversation, wouldn't he? Oh, oh we were discussing that earlier. <laughs> so I, I think about him, and that, that's what I mean by present. He is here in, you know, he, like that little dollhouse, he'd somehow look at that and uh, create a magic around it. I mean, he would love this whole media that we're doing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he would love it. He'd be in on it. And we would be having really fun. We'd have a lot of fun because we'd get lots and lots of stories. I mean, just like one of my favorite stories is during the war, he was a, 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 a warden, you know, that when the bombs were going off, he had his little uniform and his little metal hat. So instead of um, making sure everyone was, you know, he'd go into the houses 
the bombs are going off, and he's looking at the decor. He's taking his <laughs> flashlight and looking at the paintings. <laughs> and that's so. Yes, it. Uh, uh, but I, I stick with present because I think he's very present. Don't you feel that? In our lives today, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. He hasn't left. I mean, he's as, as alive today in our memories as he was alive yes, in person. Exactly. Exactly. And not everybody remains that way. No, they don't. No. So I want to ask you, what do you think John would think of doll collecting today and the effect of the internet? Oh, the effect of the internet, I think he would go for 100%. I think he would be very disappointed in doll collecting today, that it's, um, it's lost a lot of its joy. And that to him was very Fine. important. The, the, the being the adult, but having the eye of a child, the mind of a child, and how the, a child interacts with whatever doll it may be. Or, you know, how a boy is going to interact with the train that it has running around the Christmas, underneath the Christmas tree. Because John, we have to remember, was as involved with toys as with dolls. Yes. But I do believe dolls were his real love. I mean, when you... Yes, but, but he was paid to... Yes, deal, deal, deal with toys. Deal with toys. And, sure. and he did that with equal imagination. Yes. I mean, that was one of his great abilities, was to bring life to the dolls at the Museum of the City of New York. And I mean, he got a lot of good good press oh, I from mean, New York papers, and that's not easy. Well, I mean, when you could have lines down the block to get into your shows, yeah. that was, but that I think had a lot to do with his imagination. Oh, his absolutely, vision. absolutely. So when you say he would not be happy, is it because somehow the, the doll community of collectors that are not joyful or? I think because they don't have the inquisitiveness or they're, they're looking at dolls for uh, escape of the wrong sort. Correct. If that makes some sense. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. that, I, that totally makes sense. And I could see that in, in him. So you spent time with John towards the later years of his life and you spent time with him in the early part of his life and into the later part. Do you think his philosophy changed at all over a period of time? No. 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 No, I mean, I think that when opportunities were presented to him, like for instance, there was a, um, a Russian artist that he really loved and promoted, there was nothing ever um, in John's past anything quite like it so that was something new so I think he loved the new um, he was a guest curator at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art and he put on a phenomenal show with the uh, um, I believe it's the shot collection yeah. which is a very important collection and he was a storyteller it was all a story and then suddenly there's this doll that is just so, was so jarring at the time. It was the first time I'd ever seen a Jean doll. And he put it, it Melville Adams Jean doll, he put it in the exhibit and he could see that this is something that's really not like anything else. Now you see it and you go, it's a Jean doll, but this was like practically the year the doll came out. Wow. So he really, I don't think he changed because you either have good taste or imagination, or you don't. And he had it in spades. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I, I think this, but how were you and John alike? I'm much more of an adult than he is. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite answer to your question. Make him work at this. <laughs> Maybe I'm asking the wrong person. Well, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have silver nails, okay? <laughs> um, 
you know, he was just, he's, he, was, he was so much smarter than I am. I mean, I really, I will, I will say that. Um, I think that we have, in, even though we have a different um, uh, language skills, we did have a lot of the same humor. So one time I went to an exhibit and uh, he called me up and he was just breathless of, of what my opinion of the exhibit was. And I had to stop and, you know, I did a nice long pause and I just said, well, it was underwhelming. And he laughed for 30 minutes. He would say <laughs> underwhelming and then he would laugh. And, uh, so, I mean, that we had in common that we could laugh. And, um, and you know, I, I do, do uh, uh, one thing that we do, do, I delight in little small things. And it's, you know, I, th I think the, a lot of people have an image of us if, oh, Michael and David are only French fashions or only French bebés. That's not true. Yeah. You know, I like all kinds of things. And I mean, you know my little my little bunny that I have. That's one of my favorite things <laughs> in the world. You know, uh, um, so and and he would have some just quirky little things. And you think, why would he have that? Well, he but you know what? I I, I want to point into, you know, he worked really hard. I don't think people realize how hard he worked, because there were a lot of years that his articles. That's what they lived on. Yeah. So he really worked very hard. And this was not the time of, you know, send the, the document through the e an email. It, he worked very hard. I mean, you know about those oh, oh, hard yeah. times yeah. before, yeah. you know, you didn't have spell check. And but, but if I may put in an observation, you both, your minds go nonstop. They're little hamster wheels and little yes. hamsters. Yes. <laughs> I do know that, but I, I think that he had a much more, he had an ability to, um, I, you know, as I said, you know, love everything. And I don't love everything, you know, like, you know. But that's not the same as having your minds just going and exploding in every direction. And that's the two of you, as I see the two of you. Well, I, I, I have, I think, a lot more support than he did. Do you know, I think... And he, that's probably true. Yes, I have a lot more support than he did. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that makes a difference. You know, so, you know, David and I live a parallel life. You know, he's been gone for a couple of days, and now we have doing an installation in Los Angeles, and now we have something to talk about. <laughs> otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we're living the same life. But I do have more support than he has. Yeah. In a lot of ways, he was on his own. Yes. Wouldn't you yes. agree? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, running a house, running his business, yeah. and all yeah. of that. Yeah. That makes a difference. Yes, yes, it does make a difference. It does. So, I want to ask you, what did John mean to you? And what was the most important thing he taught you? Well, why doesn't she have to do three words so we could see her <laughs> flub it up again? <laughs> well, I can pull that card again if you want. That's not fair. <laughs> now I forgot what the question was. <laughs> what, how, what three words would you do, use to describe? And are you like him? Are you happy now? <laughs> no, I don't think I like him at all. <laughs> I think I'm quite different from him, uh, but that's just my perception of me. Uh, but I think John always had me thinking above and beyond what I, the level I would have gone to. He always raised the bar, kept raising the bar. Oh, Anne, you can. Oh, Anne, you can. And it was always a challenge to try and with my small legs, short legs, trying to jump that next bar, which kept on going up and up and up. And I think that that, that was a, a really wonderful um, thing. And you see, we had an interest also in historic costume. 
and he obviously applied it in very in a, any number of ways. His paper dolls are uh, phenomenal. Yes, and and also architecture. Very interested in architecture, and uh, I'd had a bit of a background in architecture, not much, but a, a little bit. So I understood where he was going in his dolls' houses and so forth. And, the pieces that he was creating. Um, so he, he, he stretched me. That's a good and friend I, and a friend and a colleague. And I've always thought that that was, the, the worst mistake I ever made was I called him once my oldest friend. <laughs> <laughs> that was not taken kindly and Do I we? announced that in public, <laughs> that I was so pleased to present my oldest friend. He took exception to that. Well, we don't really actually know how old John was. I think that he was very squirrely about that. Probably was. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. So, Michael, how do you think John would like to be remembered? Well, he'd love to have it filmed on television right now, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. No, I think that, um, I think his books his books represent him. I think that that would be enough for him. I really do. Um, you know, he did all that work. I think he. I think it should have all of his. All of his articles should have been really. Some of them have been uh, put together yeah, as no, one. But no. it, it. I think that. I think his books. He'd like to be remembered for that. I think he would like to be remembered. I mean. I do believe and I feel that he's pushed this hobby to a whole different level that it wasn't before. Um, and he did it in a way that you didn't really know that you you just took the first, you know, the first drink of the magic potion. I mean, I think, and I think he'd like to be remembered for the people that he helped. This is a, a big problem that we have today is there isn't mentoring and I think Mrs. Coleman and um, this Miss Coleman and uh, John Noble, they were very much into mentoring. You know, they would they would take you under their wing and um, uh, encourage. So I, I think I think he would like to be remembered for his work. Yeah. yeah. So I would like to ask you now, and I'd like you to read that. But I think basically, Michael, why is it important that we remember him and how you remember him? And I think you had something that spoke. This is from his book, Beautiful Dolls, which I had the pleasure of trekking the dolls or a large portion of them up and down the eastern seaboard, collecting them as sort of the moving service. And I also had the pleasure of being at many of the photo shoots. And... Uh, Which they're lovely photos. They're wonderful ones. And there's one particular photograph here of the frozen Charlottes, because at that time they were all called frozen Charlottes. This photograph was taken in a New York townhouse that the photographer found for the uh, shoot. And we started in at about nine o'clock at night and we finished at 3 a.m. in the morning, just doing the setup for this particular shot. Wow. And that's probably the longest photo shoot I was involved with. It's an amazing experience working with John and the photographer. And I think probably um, I had um, the opportunity to be around uh, probably a tenth of the pictures in this book. Wow. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a special thing. Now to go back to even more important than the pictures in this book are John's words. And John, if there's anybody who had a way with words, it was John Darcy Noble. So, here is a most enchanting category of dolls, which, 
alas, has suffered more than most from the debasement and distortion of uninformed hearsay. This is a great pity, since the spirit of these dolls is fragile and easily blurred. But perceived with a clear vision, it has a lyrical freshness not often matched. The title of the chapter, Ringlets and Ribbons. Isn't that lovely? So Michael, one last word. If you could talk to John right now, what would you say to him? Well, you probably know what I would say to him. John, we're doing World Doll Day, and I'd like you to come up, and we're going to have a uh, night in the museum, and I have a whole bunch of things for you to talk about. And he would love to do it. I would probably have to pick him up at the air. Oh, I would pick him up at the airport and he would probably forget a shoe. So he would come with one shoe. It would be some, there would always be something like that. And uh, we would have a tremendous amount of fun. And it would, it would be great. And uh, that's what I would say to him. I mean, I, I wouldn't say see you later or um, I would try to stay in the present with him, that this is what's happening. And I do kind of, feel regular, oh, he'd love this. this. This piece is crazy. Or, you know, just so enchanting in its originality. You know, so I, I mean, I, there are a lot of things on this table which we're gonna talk about later that you can just feel the energy mm -hmm. off of them, of, of John. Well, I think I personally would say thank you, John your contribution and for the lovely words that you've left with us and the wonderful memories of those of us who are most fortunate to see you and meet you and bringing the doll community together and Anne, anything you would want to say to him If only we could find the valley in Pennsylvania, the Amish Valley in Pennsylvania, which we called Brigadoon. That would please me no end to be able to come back to that magical valley that I experienced with John Nope. Well, you have to tell them what you experienced because they may not know. Well, for people who do not know the farmlands uh, maintained by the Amish in uh, basically Lancaster County, though they're all over now the country. Um, they're absolutely lyrical, magical places that look like they've just been dropped into the landscape. They're unreal in their beauty, uh, both their uh, geographical element and their uh, agricultural components and as I say th they're, they were just so wonderful and John and I used to go traveling about in my little Volkswagen and uh, we just happened upon this Brigadoon Valley which is all I can call it because we tried to find it again we went up and down it twice because it was so enchanting and uh, it literally was a magical moment, and there were many magical moments that I had with John in the car. He did not drive, I loved to drive. And uh, th those are experiences that just, to me, can't be replaced. And as long as I have a mind, it's gonna to be top of the yeah, You can pile. rewind it and, and watch the movie again. Well, yeah. thank you, thank you so thank much you. for sharing all these wonderful memories of John and thank you for staying with us and listening. Bye.